Jacques Paul Necker IPA AK NK the 30th of September 1732 to the 9th of April 1804 was a banker of Genevan origin who became a French statesman and finance minister for Louis XVI Necker played a key role in French history before and during the first period of the French Revolution Necker held the finance post between 1777 to 1781 and is remembered today for taking the unprecedented step in 1781 of making public the country's budget, a novelty in an absolute monarchy where the state of finances had always been kept a secret." Necker was dismissed within a few months. By 1788 the inexorable compounding of interest on the national debt brought France to a fiscal crisis. Necker was recalled to royal service. When he was dismissed on the 11th of July 1789 it caused the storming of the Bastille. Within a week Necker was recalled by the king and entered France in triumph. He remained in office for another year and tried to accelerate the tax reform process. Faced with the opposition of the Constituent Assembly, who changed the status of assignats to legal tender notes, he resigned in September 1790 to a reaction of general indifference. Necker, apparently a constitutional monarchist, was also a political thinker and a moralist. He wrote a severe critique of the new principle of equality before the law. Necker fully embraced the label of moderate and the concept of the golden mean. <laughs> Early life Necker was born in Geneva in a Calvinist household. In 1747 Jacques became a clerk in the bank of Thelesson and Vernet. In 1750 he was sent to Paris and worked for the bank Girardot. Soon after he managed to learn Dutch and English. On one day, he replaced the first clerk in charge of trading on the stock exchange and through a sequence of trades, he made a quick profit of half a million. In 1762, Vernet retired and Necker became a partner in the bank with Peter Thelesson who managed the bank in London, while Necker served as his managing partner in Paris. In 1763, before the end of the Seven Years' War, he successfully speculated in British debentures or bonds, wheat and possibly Canadian shares, which he sold at a good profit in the next few years. Necker had fallen in love with Madame de Vermenu, the widow of a French officer. When she went to see Théodore Tronchin she made acquaintance to Suzanne Kerchaud. In 1764, Madame de Vermenu brought Suzanne to Paris as a companion for Thelesson's children? Suzanne was suffering as her lover Edward Gibbon was forced to break the engagement. Necker transferred his love from the wealthy widow to the ambitious Swiss governess. They married before the end of the year. In 1766, they moved to Rue de Clary and had a daughter, Anne-Louise Germain, who became a renowned author under the name of Madame de Stael. Madame Necker encouraged her husband to try to find himself a public position. He accordingly became a syndic or director of the French East India Company, around which a fierce political debate revolved in the 1760s between the company's directors and shareholders and the royal ministry over its administration and the company's autonomy. The ministry, concerned about the financial stability of the company, employed the Abbé Morellet to shift the debate from the rights of the shareholders to the advantages of commercial liberty over the company's privileged trading monopoly. After showing his financial ability in its management, Necker defended the company's autonomy in an able memoir against the attacks of Morellet in 1769. Necker bought up the company's stockpiles of unsold goods and its ships when it went bankrupt in 1769. The shareholders were paid through a lottery. From 1768 till 1776 he was resident of the Republic of Geneva in Paris. Meanwhile, he made loans to the French government in the form of life annuities and by lottery operations. His wife made him give up his share in the bank, which he transferred to his brother Louis Necker and Jean Girardot in 1772. In 1773, Necker won the prize of the Académie Française for a defense of state corporatism framed as a eulogy in honor of Louis XIV's minister Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Necker was envied by his contemporaries for his fabulous wealth. He owned a capital of 6 or 8 million livres and used Chateau de Madrid as a summer house. In 1775, he published his essay Sur la législation et le commerce des grains, in which he attacked the physiocrats, like Ferdinando Galliani, and questioned the laissez-faire policies of Turgot. In May, after the «flower war» Turgot had made too many enemies and was succeeded by Cluny de Nuit, who already died in October. 
On the 22nd of October 1776, Necker was appointed as the Director du Trésor Royal on Morepa's recommendation. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Finance Minister of France. On 29 June 1777, according to his daughter in her Vie privé de Mr. Necker, he was made Director General of the Royal Treasury and not Controller General of Finance, which was impossible because of his Protestant faith. Necker refused a salary, but he was not admitted to the Royal Council. He gained popularity through regulating the government's finances by attempting to divide the tolle and the capitation tax more equally, abolishing a tax known as the vingtimied industry, a value-added tax, and establishing monts de piété, pawnshop-like establishments for loaning money on security. Necker tried through careful reforms, abolition of pensions, mortmain, droit de suite, and more fair taxation to rehabilitate the disorganized state budget. He abolished over 500 sinecures and superfluous posts. Together with his wife, he visited and improved life in hospitals and prisons. In April 1778 he remitted 2.4 million livres from his own fortune to the royal treasury. Unlike Turgot, in his memoir sur les municipalités, Necker tried to install provincial assemblies and hoped they could serve as an effective means of reforming the ancient regime. Necker succeeded only in Berry and haute guyenne installing assemblies with an equal amount of members from the Third Estate. Necker won a substantial victory by inducing the king to free all remaining serfs on the royal domain, and to invite all feudal lords to do likewise. When they refused, Necker advised Louis to abolish all serfdom in France, with indemnities to the masters, but the king, imprisoned in his traditions, replied that property rights were too basic an institution to be annulled by a decree. His greatest financial measures were his use of loans to help fund the French debt and his use of high interest rates rather than raising taxes. The collection of indirect taxes was restored to the Farmers General 1780, but Necker reduced their number by a third and subjected them to sharper scrutiny and control. The War of Independence was popular with almost every Frenchman, except Necker. France had financed its participation almost exclusively by municipal bonds, and Necker warned of the consequences for the French national budget as the war continued. For the first time the king waged a war without raising the taxes. The war had cost the state already ca. 1.5 billion livres. The ministers of war and navy were especially hostile towards him. In September 1780 Necker wanted to be dismissed, but the king refused to let him go. Compte rendu au roi In 1781, France was suffering financially, and as Director General of the Royal Treasury he was blamed for the rather high debt accrued from the American Revolution. A series of pamphlets appeared. Jacques Mathieu Aguirre attacked him on his foreign origin, his faith, and economic choices. The main reason behind this was the action of Necker, cooking the books, or falsifying the records. It brightened the picture by excluding military outlays and other extraordinary charges and ignoring the national debt. After Necker had shown Louis XVI his annual report, the king tried to keep its contents secret. In revenge, Necker made the Compte Rendu au Roy public, in no time between 30 or 200,000 copies were sold, in his most influential work, which brought him instant fame, Necker summarized governmental income and expenditures to provide the first record of royal finances ever made public. As a specific example his Compte Rendu showed the king spend more on his brothers than on public health. The account was meant to be an educational piece for the people, and in it, he expressed his desire to create a well-informed, interested populace. Before, the people had never considered governmental income and expenditure to be their concern, but the Compte Rendu made them more proactive. This birth of public opinion and interest played an important role in the French Revolution. The Compte Rendu made Necker quite popular with the masses, but it had another effect he was not expecting. Publicizing the royal finances exposed and confirmed the excessive lifestyle of the crown. Many French citizens were fed up with this lavish living. Although it was not Necker's intention, his Compte Rendu helped precipitate the fall of Louis XVI. Morepas became jealous and Vergennes called him a revolutionist. Necker contrived his own fall by declaring that he would resign unless given the full title and authority of a minister, with a seat on the Conseil du Roy. All the ministers threatened to abandon their post if this were done. 
One could not issue new loans without the Parliament's approval. When Necker was dismissed on 19 May 1781 people pilgrimaged to his estate, noblemen, clergy, magistrates, merchants, men of letters, all flocked to St. Ouen. Joseph II sent his condolences and Catherine the Great invited him to Russia. In August 1781 Madame Necker went as far as Utrecht to buy the libels that appeared in the name of Turgot against her husband. She even tried to have the booksellers arrested. Did Necker and his brother receive annually 8 million livres as a pension? In any case Jacques bought an estate in Coppet and Louis in Cologne, both near Geneva. In retirement, Necker, believing in credible policy, occupied himself with law and economics, producing his famous Traité de l'administration des finances de la France Callan tried to prevent the spread in Paris. Never had a work on such a serious a subject obtained such general success, 80.000 copies were sold. The family returned to the Paris region, supposing they were present at the wedding of their only daughter Germaine in January 1786. The impending national bankruptcy of France caused Callan to convene an assembly of notables under the elimination of parliaments in order to enforce tax reforms. It had not met since 1626. In his speech Callan expressed doubts about Necker's statistics in the Comte de Rendu. According to him they were false and misleading, as the state revenues had been revised upwards. For Callan the French deficit was caused by Necker, who had not raised the taxes. However, Callan got involved in several financial scandals and was dismissed by the king on 8 April 1787. On of April Necker replied on the charges made by Callan. Two days later Louis XVI banished Necker by a lettre de cachet for his very public exchange of pamphlets. After two months Necker was allowed to return to Paris. Necker published his, Nouveau éclaircissement sur le compte rendu? The next Minister of Finance Lomeni de Brienne resigned within 15 months. On 24 August 1788, the king allowed him an enormous pension. On 25 or 26 August Necker was called back to office accompanied by fireworks and an impressive rise of the stock exchange by 30%. This time he insisted on the title of Controller General of Finances and access to the Royal Council. Necker was appointed as Chief Minister of France. He revoked the order of 16 August requiring bondholders to accept paper instead of money. Government bonds rose 30% on the market. On 7 September Necker forbade the export of grain. The bankers advanced the treasury sufficient funds to forestall a crisis over the next year. The winter of 1788-89 was one of the bitterest in the history of France. In the summer of 1789 when the population suffered from famine Necker intervened personally and successfully at the Amsterdam Bank Hope & Co. to supply the King of France with grain. The 2.4 million in the royal treasury he used as a collateral. The one non-noble minister Necker succeeded in doubling the representation of the Third Estate to satisfy the nation, c. q. the people. His address at the Estates General on 5 May 1789 about the fundamental problems as financial health, constitutional monarchy, and institutional and political reforms lasted three hours. Necker suffered from a cold and after 15 minutes he asked a clerk to read the remainder. He invited the representatives to leave aside their factional interests and take into consideration the general, long-term interests of the nation. Personal rivalries and radical claims had to give way to a pragmatic spirit of moderation and conciliation. Necker's last sentence of the speech, "'Finally, gentlemen, you will not be envious of what only time can achieve, and you will leave something for it to do. For if you attempt to reform everything that seems imperfect, your work will lead to poor results. According to Simon Schama he "...appeared to consider the Estates General to be a facility designed to help the administration rather than to reform government." Two weeks later Necker seems to have sought to persuade the king to adopt a constitution similar to that of England and advised him in the strongest possible terms to make the necessary concessions before it was too late. According to François Mignet he hoped to reduce the number of orders, and bring about the adoption of the English form of government, by uniting the clergy and nobility in one chamber, and the third estate in another." By this refusal he became the ally of the assembly, which determined to support him. 
Necker warned the king that unless the privileged orders yielded, the states general would collapse, taxes would not be paid, and the government would be bankrupt and helpless. On the 17th of June 1789, the first act of the new National Assembly in revolutionary France declared all existing taxes illegal. Necker had legitimate reasons to be concerned about the implications of this unprecedented decision. On the 23rd of June, the king proposed to the royal council the dissolution of the assembly. On the 11th of July, Necker received a note from the king enjoining him to leave the country within a day. He finished dining very calmly, without communicating the purport of the order he had received. According to Jean Luzic they went for a walk in a park and from there got into their carriage to drive to their estate in St. Ouen at 7 in the evening. When the news became known the next day it enraged Camille de Molins. A wax head of Necker by Philippe Curtius was taken through the streets to the Tuileries. The royal guard allegedly refused to salute the wax portraits and, instead, opened fire, initiating the first bloodshed of the revolution. The threat of a counter-revolution caused citizens to take up arms and storm the Bastille on 14 July. The king and the assembly recalled the immensely popular Necker to a third ministry in a letter dated 16 July. Necker replied from Ball on 23. He wrote his brother that he was going back to the abyss. His successor, the 74 years old Joseph Fowlin de Douai, was hanged from a lamppost on the 22nd. His entry into Versailles on the 29th was a day of festivity. He demanded a pardon for Baron de Bassenville, who was imprisoned after given command of the troops concentrated in and around Paris early July. Assignats <laughs> <laughs> Necker proved to be powerless as tax revenue dropped quickly. A first loan of 30 millions 1 million livres, voted 9 August, had not succeeded, a subsequent loan of 80 millions 3 million livres, voted 27 of the same month, had been insufficient. Credit was wrecked, according to Talleyrand, for Mirabeau. The deficit was the treasure of the nation, as it had made many changes possible. In September the treasury was empty. Talleyrand, the Bishop of Autun proposed national goods should be given back to the nation. In November 1789 ecclesiastical possessions were confiscated. Necker proposed to borrow from Kes de Scompta, but his intention to change the private bank into a national bank as the Bank of England failed. A general bankrupt seemed certain. On 21 December 1789 a first decree was voted through, ordering the issue in April 1790 of 400 million assignats, certificates of indebtedness of 1,000 livres each, with an interest rate of 5%, secured and repayable based on the auctioning of the biens nationaux. Once the assignats were paid, they had to be destroyed or burnt. On 10 March 1790, on the proposition Pession, the administration of the church property was transferred to the municipalities. In the past few months Etienne Clavier lobbied for large issues of assignats representing national wealth and operating as legal tender. On 17 April 1790, the notes were declared legal tender but their interest was reduced to 3%. The assignats would compensate for the scarcity of coin and would revive industry and trade. In May 1790 the feudal and ecclesiastical properties were sold against assignats. A surety was prepared for future issues of paper money. Constitutional monarchists such as Mori, Cazalas, Burgas and Depremenil opposed it. The deputies in the convention prepared a surety for future issues of paper money. In July, Necker proposed, as the only means, an extraordinary contribution of a fourth of the revenue, to be paid at once. Half of the taxes over the preceding year were still not received. People who earned more than 400 livres were invited to go to their municipality and fulfill their patriotic duty. As it was not the final cure he asked his friends, the Genevan bankiers, to pay the arrears, the assembly c. q. Clavier turned it down. The political scene came to be dominated by clamorous spectators, passionate judges, and ungovernable agitators. Necker was continuously attacked by Jean-Paul Merritt in his pamphlets and by Jacques-René Ebert in his newspaper. Count Mirabeau, who played a decisive role in the assembly, accused him of complete financial dictatorship. For Mirabeau, to express doubts in the assignats, was to express doubts in the revolution. At the end of August the government was again in distress, four months after the first issue the money was spent. Montesquieu Faisensac, the teacher of Mirabeau, presented a report in the assembly. Assignats should be used not only for payment of church property. 
Dupont de Nemours feared the emission of assignats would double the price of bread. Necker himself argued at the National Assembly on 27 August that the assignats were a paper money which would bankrupt France. Talleyrand had also attacked them on the grounds that they risked the same fate as Law's schemes. Camus stressed what he believed was the lesson of American experience of paper, which had undermined metal money and sent prices spiraling. Condorcet and Dupont de Nemours argued that the assignats would drive out silver and other forms of coin, raise prices relative to paper, and thereby dangerously restrict commerce. All of these writers preferred the issue of treasury bills at interest through the Caisse d'Escompte, a revised tax system, and increased loans. Montesquieu had massively exaggerated the amount of the redeemable debt, probably to convince the assembly. On 27 August 1790 the Assembly decided another issue of 1, 9 billion assignats which would become legal tender before the end of the year. Necker endeavoured to dissuade the Assembly from the proposed issue, suggesting that other means could be found for accomplishing the result, and he predicted terrible evils. Necker was not backed by Comte de Mirabeau, his strongest opponent who called for national money, and won that day. When all resources were exhausted, the assembly created it paper money, according to Necker. He handed in his resignation on 3 September. The massive and dangerous issue of 1, 9 billion he succeeded to get down to 800 million, but the attacks influenced his resignation. By September 1790, all authorized assignats had been paid out by the government. Supporters of the paper money argued that since the assignats were secured by land, more notes could be safely issued as long as they were retired and burned at the same rate that the lands securing them were sold. On September 29, 1790, the National Assembly authorized a further issue of 800 million livres and abolished interest on the assignats altogether. For daily life smaller denominations of 200 and 300 livres were needed and extended to the whole of France. Necker foretold that the paper money, with which the dividends were about to be paid, would soon be of no value. Since no one had truly the right to make assignats, everyone would soon begin to do so. Montesquieu Faisensac, charged with the issue of assignats, feared stockjobbing and greed. A declaration October 14, suspending all interest payments turned the assignats into fiat paper money proper. By September 1790, the assignat had become a true circulating paper currency, and 800 million livres worth of non interest bearing notes were added to the initial issue, in denominations of 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 500, and 2,000 livres with legal tender status. The lower denominations were produced in large numbers in order to ensure wide circulation. This change stimulated the economy but also increased inflationary pressures. Necker's efforts to keep the financial situation afloat were ineffective. His popularity vanished and he resigned with a damaged reputation. Necker left leaving two million livres in the public treasury, he took one-fifth of the amount with him. <inaudible> <inaudible> Retirement Necker, suspected of reactionary tendencies, travelled east to Arcus sur Abbey and Vesol, where he was arrested and scared to death, but succeeded to leave the country. At Coppet Castle he occupied himself with political economy, and law. At the end of 1792, he published a brochure on the trial against Louis XVI. After being put on the list of émigrés in 1793 Necker was not paid any interest on the money he had left in the treasury. His house in Rue de la Chasse d'Anton, his estate in saint ouen sur seine and the two million livres were confiscated by the French government? The Neckers were far from welcome in Geneva. Many of the French émigrés considered them Jacobins, and many of the Swiss Jacobins thought them conservative. Late 1793 the Neckers moved to Beaulieu Castle, where his wife died. Necker seems to have moved to Lausanne because of the influence of the revolutionary committees in Geneva. Me Necker sank into mental illness, haunted by the macabre idea of being buried alive. She demanded to be embalmed and kept in a tub filled with wine spirit. He continued to live under the care of his daughter, living in Juin's misery. By 1794 France would be flooded by false assignats, many came from England. But his time was past, and his books had except abroad no political influence. In 1795 Germain moved to Paris with Benjamin Constant, but she would come back sometimes involuntary and founded the Cercle de Capet. In March 1798 a momentary excitement was caused by the French invasion of Switzerland when the city of Bern was attacked. 
Necker was treated with respect, when the army passed his mansion. In July 1798 he was removed from the list of émigrés. His house in the 9th arrondissement of Paris was sold to, or occupied by, the husband of Juliette Rakemeyer. Early June 1802 Necker met with Napoleon on his way to Marengo? In confidence, Napoleon told him about his plans to re-establish a monarchy in France. The publication of Necker's last views on politics and finance in 1802 upset the first consul. He threatened to exile Madame de Stael from Paris because of this book. Although Necker had never been a Republican before, toward the end of his life, he engaged seriously with the project of creating and consolidating a republic, one and indivisible, in France. Necker then foretold the suppression of the tribunate as it took place under the French consulate. His claim of two million on the state treasury was not recognized by the French Senate. Necker was buried next to his wife in the garden of Coppet Castle. The mausoleum was sealed in 1817 after Germain had been buried there too. The Charter of 1814 signed by Louis XVIII at saint ouen sur seine contained almost all the articles in support of liberty proposed by Necker before the revolution of 14 July 1789. Posterity has not been fair to Necker according to Aurelien Creutu. On the 11th of August 1792, the day after the storming of the Tuileries, all the busts were removed from the town hall, including the one of Necker by Jean-Antoine Houdin and smashed. Like Mirabeau, the Marquis de Lafayette, Barnave and Pechen Necker was only temporarily supported by the people. <laughs> Personal life Family His father, Karl Friedrich Necker, was a native of Kustrin in Newmark, Prussia now Kostzen nad Odra, Poland. After publishing some works, Karl Friedrich was appointed in Geneva in 1724 as a professor in public law. He started a boarding school for young Englishmen, later assisted by his son Louis Necker, a mathematician and a banker too. In 1786 Necker's daughter Germaine married Eric Magnus Stile von Holstein, she was to become a prominent figure in her own right and a leading opponent of Napoleon Bonaparte. On the 22nd of March 1814, she was promised 21 years of interest on her father's investment in the public treasury. After his death his daughter published, Vie privé de Mr. Necker. His grandson Auguste de Stile edited the complete oeuvres by Jacques Necker. His nephew Jacques Necker (1757–1825), a botanist, married Albertine Necker de Saussure. They took care of their uncle after his wife had died in 1794. Topic: <laughs> Places named after Jacques Necker. Necker Hospital for Children, Paris, France. Necker Island, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Topic. Works Réponse au mémoire de M. Labbé Morellet sur la Compagnie des Indies, 1769 Éloge de Jean-Baptiste Colbert, 1773 Sur la législation et le commerce des grains, 1775 Mémoire au Roy sur l'établissement des administrations provinciales, 1776 Lettre au Roy, 1777 Compte rendu au Roy, 1781 De l'administration des finances de la France, 1784, 3 volume in minus 8 degrees Correspondence de M. Necker avec M. de Callan, 29 janvier 28 février 1787, 1787 De l'importance des opinions religieuses, 1788 de la morale naturelle, suivi du bonheur des sots, 1788 Supplement nécessaire à l'importance des opinions religieuses, 1788 Sur le compte rendu au roi en 1781, nouveau éclaircissement, 1788 Report fait au roi dans son conseil par le ministre des finances, 1789 Derniers conseils au roi, 1789 Homage de M. Necker à la Nation Française, 1789. Observations sur l'avant propos du Livre Rouge, v. 
1790 Opinion relativement au décret de l'Assemblée nationale, concernant les titres, les noms et les armoiries, v. 1790 Sur l'administration de M. Necker, 1791 Reflections présentées à la nation française sur le procès intenté à Louis XVI, 1792 Du pouvoir exécutif dans les grands tots, 1792 De la Révolution française, 1796. Tome 1 Tome 2 Cours de morale religieuse, 1800 Dernières vues de politique et de finance, offertes à la nation française, 1802 Manuscripts de M. Necker, publiés par sa fille 1804. Histoire de la Révolution française, depuis l'Assemblée des Notables jusques et y compris la journée du 13 Vendemier and IV 18 October 1795, 1821 Notes Further reading Ferret, François, and Mona Azouaf. A Critical Dictionary of the French Revolution, Belknap Press, 1989 pp 287–97 Harris, Robert D. Necker and the Revolution of 1789 Lanham, M.D., 1986 Lefebvre, Georges. The French Revolution, from its origins to 1793. London, Routledge Classics, 2001. Shama, Simon. Citizens, A Chronicle of the French Revolution. New York, Random House, 1989. Swanson, Donald F., and Andrew P. Trout. Alexander Hamilton, The Celebrated Mr. Necker, and Public Credit. The William and Mary Quarterly 1990-47 No. 3 pp 422-430, in JSTOR. Taylor, George. Review of Jacques Necker, Reform Statesman of the Ancient Regime, by Robert D. Harris. Journal of Economic History 40, No. 4 1980, 877-879. doi, 10.1017 per seconds 00220507001005018 in French in French, Breeden, Jean Denis. Une singulière famille, Jacques Necker, Suzanne Necker et Germain de Style, Paris, Fayard, 1999 ISBN 2-213-60280-8. Topic. External links Jacques Necker. Bibliography of Necker's publications. Full text of Principes Positifs de M. Necker, Positive Principles of Mr. Necker, extracted from all his works.